Good evening, CCDA. Well, it's finally here, the first night. This is the big time, fellas. This is like, <laughs> I, I was a little surprised that you all asked me back. I actually grew a beard, so maybe nobody would recognize me when I came here this year. After some of the stuff I said last year, I was like, wow, they actually want me to come back. But CCDA is like a homecoming for many of us. It is for me. It's where we gather with like-minded, like-hearted kindred spirits. We're reminded of the battles that have been fought by the veterans that have gone on before us. I'm just honored to hold the same microphone that John Perkins and Barbara Skinner and Wayne Gordon and, and Mary Nelson have held and to be in the same spot where many of these great leaders that have gone and plowed the way ahead for us, we're thankful for them and the work that they have done here for CCDA. So it's a tremendous honor to be able to speak to you on this first night. They gave me the topic and the topic was called Subversion, Pursuing New Approaches to Activism, Subversion. I have no idea what that means, but that's what I'm going to talk about. Subversion, pursuing new approaches to activism. And it's interesting because I was talking about this with one of my students who's actually from Colombia. And he was telling me that the word subversion in his uh, culture actually means revolution. So our topic tonight is revolution. How do we bring revolution into a world that desperately needs revolution? Because revolutionary change, I want you to know, is already taking place. God is already doing the work of revolution. We just get to come along for the ride for that revolution that God is doing. Changes are needed in the church. Reform and renewal is needed in the church because the world is changing and the culture around us is changing. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes in review from last year. Like a good professor, I need to review the last lecture that I did, which was about a year ago, but let's review anyway. I want to talk about the changes that are occurring in our world. Most of us are familiar with these changes. We can get the slide up there. It talks about how global Christianity has changed very dramatically from a northern and western Christianity to a southern and eastern Christianity. Again, these are things that we, most of us have already recognized. That we have shifted from a majority of Christians being in, Af uh, in, a uh, in Europe and North America... You'll see that in the slide there where in the year 1900, 83% of the Christians in the world were in Europe and North America to right now, the majority of the Christians in the world are now in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And that within our lifetime, by the year 2050, more than 70% of the world, Christians in the world, will be found in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And I would say the majority of even the Christians in Europe and North America are also going to be non-white. Because the fastest growing church in Russia is African. The fastest growing church in Sweden is African. The fastest growing church in London is Nigerian. This is the reality of a global Christianity. Within 1900 to the year 2050, we will have completely flipped the table. We are going from a majority, that is 80 to 85% white Anglo-European Christianity within our lifetime to 2050, to 80 to 85% of the world's Christian population being African, Asian, and Latin American descent. This is a revolution that is occurring right before our eyes. Now, many of us, this is review, this is old news. We remember these things from books that we've read. Even 10, 15 years ago, people were talking about these changes. And I also want to remind you that these changes that are occurring in global Christianity are also changes that are occurring in American Christianity. American demographics, we already know, are in very drastic change. For example, many are projecting by the year 2050, and now that number has been adjusted, that by the year 2042, the majority of Americans in the United States, the, ma the majority of Americans will be non-white. We will have a non-white majority in the United States within most of our lifetimes. Now, that statistic is actually going to happen faster. By the year 2023, we are going to see the majority of children in the United States be non-white. So we're talking about within our lifetime, and you can try to change the laws, you can try to do border patrol, it doesn't, that's not the issue anymore. It's already done. This is already a multi-ethnic nation. This is the new face of America. But now I want to challenge you to say that this is not just the new face of America, this is the new face of American Christianity. If you look at the fastest growing churches and denominations in the United States, they tend to be multi-ethnic. 
If you look at the fastest declining denominations in the United States, they tend to be monoethnic, predominantly white. If you look at this slide coming up here, you will notice that the Lutheran Church, which is 96% white, is one of the fastest declining denominations. Congregational UCC, 89% white. Episcopalian Anglican, 89% white. Those are the three fastest declining denominations. Then you look at the two denominations that are growing the fastest. Baptists, and this includes all Baptists, Southern, American, Northern Baptist, General Baptist. You'll find that it's very multi-ethnic, and that's one of the fastest growing denominational groups. Pentecostal, certainly, one of the most diverse groups in the United States. That's also now one of the fastest uh, growing de denominations in the United States. If we're looking at these denominational trends, we will recognize that American Christianity is not diverse 10 years from now or 20 years from now. American Christianity is diverse right now, this day. What the church looks like needs to look more like those numbers that we saw, incredible diversity rather than the mono-ethnic churches that we are so used to seeing in our society right now. Let me give you a couple of challenges on this. Uh, sometime in the spring of this past year, there were two articles that were written. One was written in the Christian Science Monitor, the other was written in Newsweek. And both those articles in national periodicals talked about the decline, the demise, the death of Christianity in America. They were especially talking about evangelicalism's decline, demise, and death. Well, I want to tell you that that's not true. It's not true because if you look at all of evangelicals, not just white evangelicals, all the evangelicals, African American churches, Asian churches, Latino churches, Native churches, multi-ethnic churches, if you look at all the evangelical denominations and evangelical churches, we're not in decline. We're actually growing. And this is a surprise because everybody's focused on these evangelical churches, which is usually defined as white churches, and saying, oh, this is terrible. The evangelical churches are in decline. It's true. It is declining among whites, but it is not declining across the board. Let me show you this statistic. If you, uh, let's go to the next slide there. If you look at this graph bar right here, you'll see three graph charts. The one on the left are evangelical uh, attendance in the last 15, 20 years or so you'll see that it's relatively flat line. 9.2% of the population going to evangelical churches, down to about 9.1, not a huge difference. In the second column, you'll see mainline churches. These would be the Unitarian churches, the Episcopalian churches, the Lutheran churches. What you'll see that it's gone from 4% of the U.S. population down to 3%. Well, that doesn't sound like much, only 1% drop. But if you look at it proportionally, what we're seeing is 25% of the mainline churches have lost their attendance. So in 15 years, a church that had 100 people now only has 75 people. But you also might remember, if you think about the statistic, that that mainline church is also the most mono-ethnic and the most white. So what we're seeing is the sharp decline of white mainline churches losing 25% of its population within a very short period of time. However, if you look at the evangelical number, which is flat, or uh, we're maintaining our numbers here, if you were to take out the ethnic and immigrant churches from that number, you would find that we're doing just as bad or poorly as the mainline churches. In other words, without the growth of the immigrant, ethnic, and multi-ethnic churches, American evangelicalism is doing just as badly as the mainline churches, which many are saying are in this complete free fall. We are dealing with a ethnically diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural reality in the American church. The diversity is not something in the future. The diversity is here right now. But the challenge that I raise and I want us to talk about a little bit today is why is it that we still are beholden to a Western white ecclesiology? Why are we captive to Western cultural expressions of the church, to white culture's expressions of the church, when the reality is our world and our nation and our Christian culture has radically changed. And yet here we are operating under this Western white cultural captivity and paradigm. What I want us to do tonight is think through what does it mean for us to be part of this revolution? What does it mean for us to be part of this drastic change as we move from a white majority Christianity to a genuine and authentic multicultural Christianity? And I want to do this through my personal story. 
I want to tell you that even as we bring these challenges to you, I want it to be known that these challenges are brought out of a real life experience. When we go into our communities to serve the poor, when we go into our communities to bring the gospel, we need to live and embody that gospel and not just speak about it. So tonight I want to share my story with you as we talk about what it means to be revolutionaries in this revolutionary time. And I want to do this through the book of Haggai. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Haggai. We're going to get some of the passages up here on the top here. Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? How does it look like now? Let's give a little bit of background about what's happening here in the book of Haggai. Israel had once been a great and powerful nation. So powerful, in fact, that they were revered by all the other nations. Under two very successful kings, King David and King Solomon. David was a military leader. Solomon was an economic leader. And both of them successively were able to establish Israel as a superpower. The symbol of their superpower was actually a building. That building was the temple that was in Jerusalem. The temple was the most magnificent building for miles and miles around. People came on, on uh, journeys to see this magnificent building that Solomon had built, the temple of Yahweh. It was made out of gold, silver, precious metal, and precious stones. Everywhere you looked, you saw this glorious, glorious, glorious presence. Because this was the symbol of Israel's power and Israel's arrival as a nation. But we know the rest of the story doesn't turn out so well. The people of Israel rebel against God. God sends judgment upon them. And the Assyrians and the Babylonians take over the nation of Israel and of Judah. And they wipe out Jerusalem. And of course when they come and they find this magnificent building. They steal all the gold, silver, precious metal and precious stones. They tear this thing down. And all that's left of the temple is a pile of rubble. The Israelites are carted off into the northern kingdoms. But then through God's grace, they are brought back to their homeland. But by the time they come back to their homeland, their land is in complete and utter ruins. And that again is symbolized by the fact that their temple was just jacked up. There was nothing to see in this temple. It was a pile of rubble. When they saw this temple, they tried to rebuild it. They tried to rearrange the stones. They tried to make it look nicer. But clearly, as this passage reminds us, when they think about this temple in comparison to the former glory... They say it's nothing. In fact, at this point in Israel's history, they are just in the worst situation imaginable. They've returned home, but they can't even uh, uh, harvest the crops because their land has been destroyed. They try to rebuild the temple, and it just looks awful. A pile of rocks, a pile of rubble. And they say, this is nothing. We are the lowest of the low. We are experiencing the lowest point in our history. How many of you have been in a place like that? To be at the lowest of the low. To experience the lowest point in your life. And to feel that God is not there because you are in the lowest of the low places. My personal story is one of struggling with this issue of self-esteem, of self-perception. I'm the youngest of four children. I'm actually the only son. I have two brothers who passed away early on. So I'm the only surviving son. I'm also the youngest. And if you know anything about Asian families, being the youngest and being the only son, that's a formula for trouble. You're the constant center of attention in an Asian family just for being the only son and the youngest on top of that. Well, my, my parents were very uh, uh, aggressive, shall I say, about their, their child, about their only son. So they put me into the second grade when I was five years old. So there I am as a five-year-old with kids six, seven, uh, six and seven and eight years old and I'm in this class. Uh, they also decided that I was, I know you can't tell right now, but I was actually a very cute baby. I, I know, it's, it's hard to believe, but I was actually a very cute baby. And uh, because I was this cute four-year-old, they said, hey, let's put him into this modeling contest. So they enrolled me into this modeling contest, and I won first place in the Seoul region. And then I entered the national contest, and I finished in second place. I, I, I blew it in the uh, swimsuit competition. <laughs> so what happened is as a child model, it actually launched a career. 
I started appearing in magazine ads and print ads and on television commercials. And again, being the only, only son, the youngest, in this family where all the attention was lavished upon you, and now you're the youngest kid in second grade and all the attention is lavished upon you, and now I'm traveling throughout Korea doing photo shoots and television commercials, and all the attention is lavished upon you. And that was the life that I lived. It was a pretty nice life for a five-year-old. But then something horrible happened, something very dramatic that changed the course of my life. My family decided to move to the United States. So at the age of six, we moved to the United States. And guess what? There are no jobs for cute five-year-old Korean kids back in the 70s. This is before Gary Coleman and Webster. So ethnic cute kids just were not in vogue back then. So my movie career came to a screeching halt. Now, I had been in second grade in Korea and was ready to go on to the third grade, but obviously, because I didn't speak English, they put me back into first grade. So now I'm feeling, wait a minute, I'm the center of attention. And all of a sudden, the six-year-old was experiencing the world crumble all around him. Now, let me tell you something. Six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, I have kids in that age group. We know these kids are resilient. They're able to overcome these things. You know that. And I, and I, I would have done that, except at the age of nine, something maybe more traumatic happened. And that's my dad walked out on my family. He upped and decided that this was maybe not what he wanted to do. I don't know. But he decided to walk out on the family. Now, he was obviously the key bread earner in our family at that time. So with no financial provision, my mom had to go to work and find pretty much any job that she can find. So during the day, she would go and work in inner city Baltimore at this little carryout. And she would help and, and serve at this little carryout during the day. And then she would come home and make sure the kids were okay and then go and work a night shift in a nursing home and be there all night, come back in the morning and feed us breakfast and, and, and make sure that we went off to school, catch about three or four hours of sleep, and then go back to work in that carryout. She worked 20 hours a day, six days a week, but she made sure to take that seventh day for the Lord and attend the church on that seventh day. But what happened was my mom was now or not around anymore. So not only had my dad left, my mom was not around anymore. And because of the drop in our economic circumstances, my dad not being around, my mom having to work these menial jobs that didn't pay a whole lot, without health insurance, without all those benefits that other people might get in other jobs, we, we ended up on food stamps. We ended up living in a very, very poor Baltimore inner city neighborhood. The neighborhood that I grew up in was one-third black, poor, one-third poor whites, and one-third recent Korean immigrants. None of us got along with one another. In fact, I remember as an elementary school student just being terrified of walking home because we had to cut through the graveyard. If you walked around the graveyard, it took like 30 minutes. But if you cut through the graveyard, it took 5, 10 minutes. So here we are, like 7, 8, 9 years old and little kids, and we're cutting through the graveyard, running as fast as we can because we know that those beatdowns occur in that graveyard. I remember the police sirens, and I remember the, in fact, I went back to the neighborhood that I grew up in a few years ago, and I said, wow, I grew up here? But those were the context that many of us might have recognized and realized that that was the context that we were in. And I remember being afraid all of the time when I was a kid, living in inner city Baltimore, back then, skinny, still short, Asian kid, growing up in a rough neighborhood, poor, alone, and lonely, with horrible self-image. I was ashamed that my family was on food stamps. I was ashamed because all the other kids made fun of the free lunch kids. I was ashamed because we had a block of government cheese in our freezer. Whose idea was that, by the way? Asians do not know what to do with cheese, and they gave us a big old chunk of American cheese. That thing is still in a freezer somewhere in inner city Baltimore. <laughs> cheese and kimchi does not mix at all, I'm telling you. But here's the amazing thing. In the depths of our despair, in the depths of our suffering, in the depths of our sorrow, God still finds us. God finds us and transforms us wherever we might be. In fact, I sometimes wonder if God is doing greater work when we are weak and suffering than when we are doing well. That sometimes the work of God is even more magnificent in the places of our weakness and suffering and in our struggle, God's work is amplified even more. So I want to ask the question about relocation because that's one of the important things that we talk about here at CCDA. It's one of the, the three values, the three R's or something that I've really tried to live into. And I, I want to reimagine that a little bit. What does relocation look like in this new age? 
What does relocation look like in this new era, this next evangelicalism, this next America? What does relocation look like, and do we actually have relocation backwards? Because we've assumed relocation meant that those who have go to the people who do not have and dump our haveness on the have-notness. And that's been our uh, perception of this is what it means to relocate. We, the wealthy, privileged, and powerful, we're going to bless the poor, marginalized, and the least of these. Aren't they blessed that we can bless them with our privilege? In fact, I read a lot of urban ministry books. It's part of my job. And I find over and over and over and again, most, if not all, of the urban ministry books are about a rich, white, suburban person who moves into the inner city and saves those poor black folk. And that's how we teach urban ministry. That's how we teach relocation oftentimes. Let's get the wealthy, privileged people and come and move to the poor people and save those poor lost souls. What revolution means is that maybe we reverse that paradigm sometimes. Maybe we start talking that the have-nots have so much to teach us that we have not learned because we are so caught up in our wealth and privilege. Maybe this is the revolution. To not maintain that power dynamic of the wealthy and the affluent, the educated and the privileged over the unprivileged, over those who have not. But a revolution means we turn that completely upside down. It means giving up of that power rather than hanging on to that power. Now let me see if I can get a little more controversial. Don't mistake what I'm about to say. I absolutely believe in environmentalism. I absolutely believe in creation care. I am 100% behind the work that we need to do to be good stewards of creation and to care for the environment. However, let me raise this challenge. Social justice and concern for justice issues, which used to be taboo 40, 50 years ago by a larger evangelical movement, is now an in thing. And every church and their cousins are now talking about social justice. And it's become this buzzword. It's become a means to grow churches. It's become a means to, to make yourself feel good about yourself. So the phrase social justice, oftentimes, because it's such a politically correct thing now, and it's in vogue, we're losing the power of that phrase. I mean, even Walmart thinks they're green. That's what we've come to. So when we start talking about social justice, are we talking about the... The giving up of power that is needed in order for there to be true, true social justice. Again, I support the work that we do to save the environment and to care for God's creation. But I want to raise the question, why is there such a rush to get into the environmental justice movement by white evangelicals? And staying away from racial justice by many white evangelicals. Because if you are jumping into the environmental movement and not into racial justice, guess what? You don't give up any power. In fact, there are some elements of environmental justice you can jump in and say, well, it's those Chinese people that really need to change their ways. It's those Indians. They're the ones that are really doing all this carbon mess-ups. And so now you've maintained the power. I'm asking, is there a cost to justice? For many, there is not that cost. And are we ignoring racial justice? Because when we enter into racial justice, somebody's going to have to lose some power. Somebody's going to have to give up cap cultural captivity. Something's going to have to change. And that might cost, that cost might be borne by you, the upper class white person. That's what it might mean to engage in justice. Not just to say this is the politically correct thing we're going to grab onto. Why are we gravitating to places where justice doesn't cost us anything. I got to tell you, we need to recognize the power of power in our discussion on justice. Recognize that whenever we talk about justice issues or community development or community transformation, we are dealing with power. It is about power. And I want to ask you, and this is something I said last year, how many of you are willing to change that power dynamic just in your own personal life? I said this last year. I said that if you are wanting to be an urban missionary, and you want to serve um, as the cities or the communities as a missionary, and you've never had a non-white mentor in your life, you're not a missionary, you're a colonialist. You're coming into the urban communities, the inner cities, with your brand of white evangelicalism and transforming them to your brand of white cultural Christianity rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
because you don't know anything else. Because you've never experienced justice from that other angle. Because some of that justice requires the giving up of your power. What I'm asking is, are we willing to be at that place of brokenness, of the walls falling and falling down, and still say, God is still good in the midst of my brokenness as well as in my strength. Blessed are the poor. Not let's go bless the poor, but blessed are the poor. Now this passage moves us into this really great explanation of three things that God calls us as we are to live into uh, this, this challenge to be strong in the Lord. You'll see in the passage here it says be strong three times. And each of those I want to ta tackle as we look at this issue of relocation. The first be strong is to be strong in the Lord because you have a covenant of grace that operates in your life. And this is something that I want us to remember. That when we're doing relocation, it is not a work. It is not a task. It is not another thing to check off on our to-do list. It is an act of grace because we have been recipients of grace. Not by works that any of us should boast. Let's talk about this covenant of grace. In the passage in uh, Haggai chapter 2 verse 5, it says that uh, the Lord is with us. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Now think about Israel. They messed up. They committed sin after sin after sin. They disobeyed, they disobeyed. And yet God says to them, I have a covenant with you. And my spirit is with you. What does that mean? It means despite the fact they didn't live up to the works of God, God still loves them. And God still has a covenant with them. Because God's covenant with us is not one of works where we attain by doing this good work. But it is one of grace where we receive it as a free gift from God. Are we operating under a covenant of works when we do the good works? Or are we operating under a covenant of grace? Let me tell you the story about my, my family a little bit more. After my dad left the family, we didn't hear from him for several years. In fact, uh, one, year, one day out of the blue, about two or three years after he had left the house, we get, I got this random phone call. It happened to be from my dad. I pick up the phone and he starts talking to me. And I'm shocked because I hadn't heard from him in two plus years. But then he starts asking me all these questions. He asks me about how I'm doing in school, what grades I'm getting. He asks me about Baroque music and Renaissance art. And I, I didn't know anything about this stuff. I said my favorite Renaissance artist was Picasso. What do I know? But I'm going on and on in this conversation. And the message that I heard from my earthly father on that day is unless you do these things, you don't deserve my love. Unless you get straight A's in school. Unless you know all this information. Unless you make me proud of you or do all these good things then I won't love you. And that's the message that my 11-year-old mind learned on that day. Now what we do with those things, we internalize those things. We internalize those messages because that message from our earthly father is so strong. And I started living into that. So I started getting A's in school. I started doing well. I started doing the best that I can so that I can earn my father's love. Now I became a Christian. And that paradigm still spilled over into my spiritual life. And now instead of trying to please my earthly father with good grades and being involved in clubs and trying to do all these good things, now I try to do good works for my spiritual father. And so I want to, how can I best serve and honor my spiritual father with all these good works? Well, I got to become a professional Christian, which means I got to go to seminary. And I got to get good grades in seminary. And I got to go and be a pastor of a, of a, of a large church. Or I got to do all these good works. But you know what? After a while you realize it doesn't work. It doesn't work. This revelation actually hit me at about my, 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 my last year in seminary. And I was, I was stunned because here I was getting good grades in seminary, doing good work in seminary. And at the end of the day, I still felt like I was so far from the Lord. In fact, by my last year in seminary, I said, you know what, Lord? I don't think you want me to be a pastor. I don't think you want me to be your servant. Because what I had done, in the same way that my dad had a list for me and said, these are the ways that you fall short as my son... I thought God the Father had a list for me as well. That he was keeping a record of my wrongs, saying these are the ways that you fall short of my glory. Therefore, why would you even think that you could do good works for me? And I kept that mental list. And I would in fact go back to it every once in a while and say, God, you can't expect me to be your servant. Look at this list of faults. Look at the list of shortcomings. You know my faults and my shortcomings, Lord. How would you even, why would you even want me to be your servant? So in fact, during that time, I said, I'm not going to be in ministry. 
It was around that time that I was uh, asked by a group of friends to go to this conference. And I said, all right, I'll go to this conference, but you know I'm not going to be a pastor, so I'll just go along with you. We'll have a good time. We'll go out to late night dinners and all that kind of stuff. So we go to this conference, and the conference was really spiritually intense. People would come around and pray, and they would be falling on the floor and crying and weeping. And I kind of hid away from it because the last thing I wanted to do was cry. I was not going to cry because I knew if I cried, I would have this emotional uh, experience. And I just didn't want that at that moment. So if I kind of hid in the corner, meanwhile, people are falling all around, all around me. So I'm the only one left. So I must be the only one that, that, that needs prayer. So people are now coming to pray for me. So I said, I, I got to get out of the way here. So I started, I knelt on the ground. So, so make sure that I, I'm on the ground too. So, so I don't want people to, to, to think that I needed prayer. But they still found me somehow. And I'm praying with my knees on the ground. And I'm praying, God, how could you ever want me to be your servant? Look at this list. Look at all the ways that I failed you and I must have let you down. And as the people gathered to pray around me, I kept standing it with more fervency. God, how could you even use me? How could you even consider me a part of your kingdom? Why would you even want me to be your servant? Look at this list. Look at this list. And then it came one of those moments where God actually spoke. And God said, what list are you talking about? What list are you talking about? Do you even think I ever kept a list of your wrongs? Do you really think that I kept a record of all your shortcomings? I have taken your sins as far as the east is from the west. I've removed your iniquities from you. My covenant with you is not one of works where you have to earn my love. My covenant with you is one of grace where I lavish it on you anyway. So the work that we do is not work that we attain. It's not work that we do in order to earn the Father's love. We live and operate under a covenant of grace. And that's what relocation is. The living out and working out of God's grace. I want to talk about reconciliation. Because the next passage talks about God's power at work. And this is God's power at work to bring healing. Let's go to that next verse here. God's power at work to bring healing. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord. God is reminding us that he has the power to bring healing. And when we talk about reconciliation, this is not possible without the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not possible unless God allows us to be involved in this. We need to know that the grace of God, the Spirit of God is absolutely essential when it comes to the work of reconciliation and healing. Several years later, I have now grown up, married, two kids. At that point, actually, when this story takes place, we had a daughter, beautiful daughter, two years old at that time. Now she's uh, uh, coming up on nine years. Her ninth birthday is coming up. She's two years old. And around the, time, uh, around the time that she was about to turn two, my dad suffered a stroke. And I heard word about it back up in Boston where I was living. My family was down in Maryland. So I rush down to Maryland to, to deal with what's going on. My dad actually ends up in a hospice, and he is very sick. The doctors are not sure he's going to make it. What they do say is he's going to have a tough time communicating. There's been a lot of damage. He won't be able to talk. He won't be able to move. We're not sure what the prognosis for recovery is, but there it is. The man that I had had such conflict with over the years, the man that who I had tried so hard to earn his earthly love and felt like I had failed over and over again, there it was. He was now on his deathbed. At about that same time that my dad was dying, my daughter was, uh, uh, was diagnosed with a condition called neutropenia. There are different strains of neutropenia, but basically what it is is that the white blood cells have three different types. One type of those blood cells fights bacterial infection. Those are called neutrophils. In neutropenia, the neutrophils go down to such a level that your body can't fight bacterial infections. My daughter was teething at the time. And if any of you have had teething kids, you know that there is a lot of bacteria in one's mouth when you are teething. And her body, because she had this neutrophil, uh, low neutrophil count, neutropenia, she couldn't fight this infection. So her, her temperature would spike to 104, 105 degrees. We would rush her into the hospital. They would pump her full of antibiotics, and they would try to bring the fever down. We would stay in the hospital for several nights. They would uh, check her neutrophil count. It's supposed to be about 1,200. That's the average, 1,200 to 1,000. But hers was down to 200. At one point, it was down to zero. So they would pump her with uh, antibiotics, and then we would rush home. And then after a few days, she would seem okay, but then another bacterial infection would break out. We would rush back to the hospital, and we'll have to go uh, do a whole round of treatments again. 
And neutropenia is, an, is a condition where the body attacks itself. It doesn't recognize that the neutrophils are good, and so the body destroys its own blood cells. And that's what was going on with my daughter. And meanwhile, I'm flying back and forth from Maryland trying to figure out what to do with my dad. In fact, after about a month in the hospice, I get this very urgent phone call from my brother-in-law saying, your dad's probably not going to make it through the week. You need to come down right away. So I fly down, and I am by my, my, uh, my dad's bedside, and I'm still not resolved that my dad's going to die. In fact, I walk away and I go down the hallway to sit with my sisters and my, and my mom to talk about other stuff. But they're talking about the funeral arrangements. And it hits me. My dad is not going to live. He's going to die. So I go back into the room and I kick out my nieces and nephew who is sitting there. And I go over to my dad and I grab his hand. And I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I forgive you. I'm sorry for the bitterness that I've harbored against you. I'm sorry for the ways that I have not forgiven you, but that I love you and I forgive you. Now, he couldn't talk. He can blink his eyes and he could squeeze my hand, and that's what he did. With tears running down his cheeks, he squeezed my hand, and there was reconciliation between my father and I. He passed away a day later, but he died knowing that his son had forgiven him and that he had extended forgiveness to his son. That does not happen. Because I willed it to happen. That only happens because the power of God is able to heal. And the power of God is able to bring reconciliation. We return home. My, my wife and my daughter came down to see him for the last time. And he opened his eyes, saw, my grand, saw his granddaughter, closed his eyes. He went to sleep that night and didn't wake up the next morning. We go back to Boston, and we are now going through the whole course of treatments again. Her fever is spiking, and she's having all this trouble. So... Uh, what, out of the blue, our, our, our doctor says, you know, we're going to try this experimental medica medication. It hasn't been, uh, 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 it's, it's a new thing. It's not FDA approved, but we want you to try this experimental medication. We said, all right, it seems like all of the things have not worked, so go ahead and try it. So they were going to administer it on Sunday morning because their fever was very high. I said, go ahead and administer it. I have to go to church. I went to church that day, and I asked the church to pray for my daughter. Uh, that morning, they took the blood sample and found that her neutrophil count was about 200. Again, the normal is about 1,000. It was down to about 200. That evening, they, they, that afternoon, they gave her the shot. That evening, they took the blood sample again and said, this is pretty amazing, but your daughter's neutrophil count is up to 1,200. And they said, you know, this thing doesn't really work that fast. Because God had brought healing to our daughter. Since that day, my daughter has not had a single instance of a problem with neutropenia. On October 28th, she's going to celebrate her ninth birthday, and she is the happiest, most joyful child you will ever see. That's the power of God. Now, there's a couple of things I want to talk about there. One is the power of God to heal in even the most difficult of circumstances. But the other is, I wonder, and I don't have a quantif quantifiable evidence for this, but I wonder is if my forgiveness for my father had something to do with the healing of my daughter. Because something in the family meant that my anger and my bitterness was destroying something within our family. The same way that neutropenia operates. It recognizes something in the body as hostile when it's not hostile, and it destroys it. And was my bitterness, my anger, my hatred towards my dad, was that eating itself up? And was that what was manifest? And once the reconciliation and healing occurred, did God bring healing and reconciliation to the whole family? Reconciliation. Can we bring healing and wholeness to this community? Can we bring healing and wholeness to this community? Not by human effort, but by the power of God. Can we bring the power of God to bring healing among the broken lives? Bring healing among the broken uh, relationship between different races and cultures and nationalities? Only by the power of God. I want to talk about redistribution. God is at work in doing something like redistribution. But it's done in a way that I think we need to recognize this is truly God's work. Because in verses 6 through 9, it talks about the desire of all nations. And the glory of God of this house will surpass the glory of the former house. Now think about the context of the passage with me one more time. Think about this context that here we have this story of this temple that had fallen and was just a pile of rubble. And yet, God says through the prophet Haggai, the glory of this pile of rocks 
will be greater and will surpass the glory of Solomon's temple. How can this be? This makes no sense. Solomon's temple had gold, silver, precious metal, and precious stones. This temple is just a pile of rocks thrown together. How can it be that this temple will be more glorious than Solomon's temple? The answer comes in verse 6. I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. Who is the desired of all nations? Jesus. Because historically we know this, that even though that temple was just a pile of rocks thrown together with no silver, no gold, no precious metal, no precious stones, Jesus himself walks into that temple. And I don't care how beautiful and how magnificent or how opulent Solomon's temple was, there is nothing more glorious. The second Jesus walks into that pile of rocks, there is nothing more glorious than that pile of rocks. My friends, when we work in these communities, we will see piles of rock. In fact, our lives are piles of rubble, broken and strewn about. But the second Jesus comes in, there is nothing more glorious, nothing more magnificent. Let me finish with the story. Several years ago, after we had planted our church, we had, um, I had a friend visit from me from college. And my friend was kind of talking about this uh, really successful life that he had fashioned for himself. And I was very happy for him. He was a good guy. He was uh, kind of uh, doing really well because he was working on Wall Street during the time of uh, the, the dot-com boom back in the 90s. So you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of money back then. So he was kind of describing the good life that he was living uh, as uh, someone who was a high-ranking high, high, high executive at, uh, at, a, at a, a major Wall Street firm back during the 90s. Uh, he was talking about how this company would have soirees at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, how they would have, you know, $100 steak dinners. And that uh, as they cut into the steak, it would, it would melt. And they would, he would put it in his mouth and it would dissolve as he ate the steak. Now, I love red meat. That's my kryptonite. I just can't live without red meat. And as he's describing this, even now, there's a little drool forming on the side of my mouth. Thinking about a steak so tender, it just dissolves in your mouth. And then he was telling me about how his company had courtside seats at Knicks games and how he, he got to sit behind Patrick Ewing. Now, this guy doesn't like basketball, never played basketball. I'm a huge Ewing fan. I'm a huge Knicks fan. And, and there he is going to these games. And I'm thinking, you know, that could have been my life. We went to the same school. Yeah, I, that could have been me. I, I thought about maybe going on Wall Street and studying and, and, and doing some business work. Yeah, that could have been me. But that's not the path that God led me to. So as he goes on and on about this really wonderful life that he lives as a broker on Wall Street, I, I said, well, you know, you've kind of talked about what you do every day. Let me tell you about what I do every day. Uh, we were, we were uh, my wife and I were married, but we didn't have kids at the time. So we picked up my wife from her work. She's a school teacher. And then we said, well, this is what we do. We go to our neighborhood and we, we talk to some of our friends in our neighborhood. And there happens to be this family that has uh, uh, five kids and they're very active kids. But we go over there and we try to help out because both parents work really hard. And it's an immigrant family. And we go and we, uh, my wife being a special ed teacher, we try to teach them some skills. And I hang out with the kids. And so why don't you come with us? So we go over to this friend's house. And, and it, was, it was just chaos that day. I mean, you know what it's like. You just get kids after school. They've pent up all this frustration. And literally, they were flying around the house. I mean, they were jumping from the dining room table to the couch, off the wall, hanging from the chandeliers. And they were just going nuts all over this place. And, and in fact, one of the kids, the youngest, two years old, is on the floor, gave me the middle finger and starts using four little words. And, Power of God bind you or something. I don't know. This was crazy. What's going on? And kids are flying through the hair. Exorcist 3 is at my foot. Footsteps. And, and it's going crazy. And my million-dollar friend is cowering in the corner in fear because these kids are running all over the place. And as I'm looking at this chaos, I look towards my million-dollar friend and his steak dinners and his Knicks tickets and his soirees at the Metropolitan Museum. And I say, you can keep those things because this is the kingdom of God and there is nowhere else I would rather be. When you walk through this ministry, you will see piles of rubble wherever you go. You will see it in your own life, in your own family, in your friends, in the people you minister to, in the people you minister along with. You will see people that are piles of rubble. But the second Jesus walks into that temple, 
there is nothing more glorious. I don't care how much gold, silver, precious metal, or precious stones that Solomon had. The second Jesus comes into the temple, there is nothing more glorious. And that is what we redistribute. The glory of Jesus in our lives. The presence of Jesus in our lives. Let me close with this challenge to you. In my first year in seminary, I was full of dreams. I was full of great things I wanted to accomplish for the kingdom. I said, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to save all these lost souls. I'm going to start a church of five, ten, hundred thousand people. And it's going to be a massive church. And we're going to do all these great works in the city. And I had these great dreams and I was not shy about sharing it with anybody and everybody. I would tell everybody about this great dream that I had once I graduated from seminary. This is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to change the Christianity. I'm going to do all these things. Things. And I remember this uh, senior who was just about getting ready to graduate. He listened patiently to the things that I was saying. As I went on and on about these great, grandiose dreams that I had to do the work of, of God, he listened very patiently and he said, I envy you. I envy you because I used to have those kinds of dreams too. I used to dream about doing great things for the kingdom of God. But after this last few years and all that's happened, I don't have those kinds of dreams anymore. So I envy that kind of passion and the zeal that you have for the Lord. And I envy that you have these big dreams, but I just don't have that anymore. And at the end of the day, with all these dreams broken and all these dreams lost, there's one thing that remains. I just want to be faithful to the Lord. Friends, we can go out and build beautiful temples. We can go out and build magnificent buildings. Programs that are the envy of everybody around us. But can we just be faithful to the Lord. Lord, thank you for the work that you do in our midst and for the blessing of CCDA. For it is in your name we pray. Let the church sing.